All right, how's it going, everybody? Uh, today we are delving uh, deeper into uh, the brain, uh, specifically talking about some of the um, specific areas of the brain, um, keeping it fairly simple. Once again, we're not delving too deep into uh, the, the real deep insides of what the brain does, just kind of continuing to skim that surface. Uh, so what we are gonna talk about here is we are going to talk about the motor strip. So the motor strip is in the frontal lobe of the brain. It's kind of in that back half, that back, very back part of the brain uh, here. And what it's going to do is it is going to help control voluntary movement. Uh, so to give you an idea of how much um, how many like neural connections there are to different parts of the body. Um, the more neural connections that you have in a certain area, the more that you're able to do with that thing. So what you'll see in this homunculus is you'll see that the hand is really big and the same with the mouth is also really big. So all that is saying is that there are a lot of neural connections in that space, which means that we have a lot of maneuverability in them. Same with the mouth. Your ability to talk means that your mouth has a lot of places that it has to move and has to do a lot of things in order for it to work. So we have your elbow and your wrist here um, are drawn very, very small. And if you think about what you can do with your elbow and your wrist, it's very small. Very few things that you can do. Um, and that's just showing how much maneuverability that you have. So an example I like to look at are your toes. So Normally your toes are really really uh, are small in this because you don't really you really just kind of need your toes for balance You don't really use them um, for much else um, But if you think about your hand you can move individual digits fairly easily now try doing that with your toes wiggling your big toe you can do fairly okay Maybe wiggling your pinky toe you can do okay, but what about the three in the middle? How difficult is it to move one individually? And in the end, it's very difficult because we just don't use it very much. Now, what about someone who doesn't have the use of their hands or their arms? Very often, they might use their feet in order to write things or to hold things or to do stuff. Um, so you'll see people with their their toes, if they need to use it, will have much many more neural connections and they'll have more maneuverability with them. Your toes could do a lot of things if you just kind of practice with them a little bit more. So. Next, we have the sensory cortex or the somatosensory strip. So this is in the uh, front front part of the parietal lobe. Okay, so you get your parietal lobe here. Remember, that's just in the back top half of the brain. Okay, and so you have the somatosensory strip. It's right next to the motor cortex. You can see them over here. Okay. And so the somatosensory strip, what its job is, it is supposed to register and process um, body touch and movement sensations. So being able to feel when you're like your hands are moving and you know the sense of touch that you have. Uh, so once again, we have a homunculus over here to kind of give us a better understanding of what areas we have more sensation with. Uh, you can see here the face and the toe and the fingers are very sensitive. So you can take your finger, you can tap it on your uh, lip, and you can see, uh, you can feel it in your lip more than you can with your finger. It's because they're very sensitive. You can do the same with your um, elbow or maybe your knee. You touch your elbow and you can feel it more in your finger than you can in your elbow. That's because we have more sensation here. Um, just think about something that's very soft when you want to feel it. Nobody uses their elbow to, you don't rub a smooth silky thing in your elbow and be like, ooh, it's so soft. You take it, you rub it with your hands, you rub it on your face and you're just like, ah, oh, that's a very soft thing. And that's because we have more um, uh, neurons that connect to those areas that help us uh, sense those things. And um, you can see here, once again, these are the parts of our body that we use most to sense things. And that means there's simply more neural connections there. So next we have the association functions or the association areas. Basically, this is parts of the cerebral cortex, parts of that, that, that higher functioning brain that are involved in very specific higher functions. So you have like individual spots in your brain that do very, very specific things. Um, so 
there are lots of them um, and we're only really going to talk about two and once again association areas association functions these are specific places in the brain that do very specific things so we're going to talk about two of them the first of them is the Broca's area so the Broca's area is in the left hemisphere of the brain only the left hemisphere of the brain and it's in the frontal lobe and its job is to control the motor movement of the mouth while you are speaking. So your jaw, your tongue, your lips, all of that is controlled in the Broca's area. So what happens is if you could not use the Broca's area, if it was damaged, um, if you, you know, hit your head or um, had a seizure and that part of the area was damaged, what you wouldn't be able to do is you could read, you could write, but when you attempted to speak, the muscle memory of how your mouth moves in order to enunciate certain sounds and make certain sounds would just not be there. So you really wouldn't be able to talk. Um, it would be difficult for you even to start sentences because you just couldn't get your mouth to move properly. Um, so it would be very difficult for you to speak in any way. So next we have the larynx area, and this is also on the left hemisphere, and it is in uh, the temporal lobe. And simply put, this, um, this part of the brain, what it does is it, it helps us process um, language expression and comprehension. So it helps us process language expression and comprehension, so our ability to speak properly and speak what we want to say and also understand what is being said to us. So a person that has damage to the larynx area might be unable to understand or comprehend anything that is said to them. Um, they can't think about language and have that thing process and understand. Like they can hear perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with what they're hearing but their ability to understand the spoken language is gone. Also, their ability to talk would also be damaged. So their muscle movement is fine. They could enunciate things, but it would kind of be like hearing a baby like mumble and gurgle through things. Um, there just wouldn't be any ability to really uh, properly say the right words and, do the, and say the right things. It would just all kind of be a jumbled mess. Um, as they would talk, it would just, you know, be a lot of mo, bo, 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 um, but not a lot of actual words coming out. So, um, outside of that, we have uh, a concept. This is just something that you guys need to know, uh, known as plasticity. So basically, when the brain gets damaged, that's not the last, you know, that's not the end of it, you know. Um, you get hit in the head, you're not going to be messed up forever. Um, your brain has the ability to fix itself, and that concept is known as plasticity. So your brain can change its shape. Um, your brain can have different uh, other parts of the brain pick up and take over for um, damaged areas. You can have new neural co connections being made. Um, and so this is how our brain resp responds to damage. Um, if someone loses their uh, sense of sight, um, we are so reliant on our sense of sight, but what's gonna happen is our occipital lobe is gonna stop working, it's gonna stop doing stuff. So the temporal and the parietal lobe are both gonna seep into the occipital lobe and be like, hey, you don't need this region, why don't you come help us? Hey, you don't need this, you, you don't need to see, so why don't you help us here? So people who are blind generally are much better at hearing and much better at their sense of touch um, because other, you know, they have more of their brain that is working on that and they are reliant on those other things. So that is plasticity. Uh, generally speaking, it is most potent in children, um, especially people who are below the age of 25. As you remember, people who are below the age of 25, their brain is still forming. And so the brain's ability to change and reform is much more potent uh, during that time. Um, afterwards, it, it slows down quite a bit. Okay, so next we have the corpus callosum. So simply put, the corpus callosum is a band of neural fibers 
that connects the two hemispheres of the brain. Basically, you have two hemispheres of your brain that communicate with it, with, and the corpus callosum is what allows them to communicate with each other. The, the right side of your brain controls the left side of our body. The left side of our brain controls the right side of our body. So if I had a PET scan on right now, and I'm waving my right arm, the, um, the left brain would be act, the parts of my left brain that control my arm would be active. Um, and so the corpus callosum helps uh, transfer information from the two sides. So think of it kind of like the thalamus, um, and it's just what the brain does to help it itself you know, figure out what it's doing. Um, so this is why um, when you try to rub your head, you rub your tummy and pat your head, and you can sometimes get those signals crossed. You know, I, I usually do both like the patting, but also the circular motion. Um, so um, it, basically those signals are getting, you know, kind of mixed up and crossed over uh, when you try to do that thing. Okay, uh, so that is uh, just a little bit of a deeper dive into uh, the brain. I uh, hope you guys have a great day, and we'll see you later.